to get a copy of the book and at least be reading, at least of where we're at, um, or at least be able to get it by next week. So today we're going to be discussing chapters 11 through 17. And let's start off with a quick vocabulary term, like usual. Uh, what's a sextant? Does anyone want to explain what this instrument is? Go ahead, Josh Pipes. The sextant was a tool that sailors used, and they'd stand against the sun and measure how far they were from the nearest coast. Good, good. So it's used for, what is it used for? Either Josh or anyone. Charting latitude. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. So exactly right, and Maria latitude exactly right okay so this is a tool that Nathaniel uses quite a bit right and right Jacob is right right because they don't always have the coast so uh, it's, a, it's a tool that's used sorry one moment Okay, sorry about that. Had a little problem with the computer for a second there. Okay, exactly right. Uh, did anyone have anything else they wanted to add in? Okay. So we talked about a literary plot last week. Does anyone remember what that literary term was? It was man versus something blank. Close. Um, nature and man versus nature is what we'll be talking about a little bit today. Um, there was another one we talked about last week. It was man versus Maria. Exactly. Maria got it. It was uh, yeah, man versus society. Very good. Very good. Does anyone remember what that what that means when we use that word or phrase? Can I answer? Absolutely. Go ahead, James. Uh, so basically what man versus society means is that uh, one the protagonist has different ideas about how society should work, and the society is uh, kind of against the ideas. Good. So is man versus society a bad thing or a good thing? It could be either. Very good. Very good. Does anyone have an example that they can think of um, where we see this either in the book Carry on, Mr. Bowditch, or in real life? Okay, good. So as Jacob said, Jacob Heights, he said, right, Nat Bowditch is having some ideas about navigation. They're new, and it's hard uh, many times for either in our personal lives or family or society or community to accept 
new ideas, especially when they're different than tradition. Um, so the, here's an example of uh, Nat Botus trying to introduce a new idea that is a little hard, harder for people either to understand or accept. Um, Caleb brought up the example of Joseph Smith, good example. And sometimes it, so in those, in those cases, we see man versus society where man is trying, the protagonist is trying to introduce a good change and society is going against it. And sometimes it works vice versa. So for instance, during the early 1800s, you have a lot of men who were trying to introduce new ideas about education and government and culture. And society resisted against those because society was founded in large part on the scriptures and on the Bible. And these men were trying to introduce these new ideas. And so in that case, it was flipped. Society, was hold, society had good traditions and good foundations that were in conflict with these new ideas. And society was in the right while these men were in the wrong. And um, so it can go both ways. Okay, good. So today we're going to be, the literary term we have today is man versus nature. So again, remember, conflict creates the plot, right? Sometimes we look at conflict as a bad thing, but conflict is what produces change. Conflict is what, and when we become engaged in conflict, that's what can help us become better people. Um, it's that refiner's fire that changes and purifies. Uh, there's a quote from Joseph Smith where he said, um, he said, I'm an individual and I come in contact with all of the evil of the world. And when I do, it refines me, it purifies me, and it makes me a better instrument to be used in the hands of the Lord. Okay, let me just, one second. There's a few who want to be made a panelist. So let me just... Um, for those who are messaging me wanting to be made panelists, um, go ahead and raise your hand and then I'll just look down through about every five minutes and and make you a panelist. And then otherwise I won't be checking the question box quite as much once the lesson has started. Okay. So conflict versus nature in man versus nature. So that is the idea that, that you have a single human life. So specifically in, sorry, we're getting some echoes. So if everyone can make sure that they're muted, unless they're going to make a comment. So you have in, for instance, in Daniel Bodic, right? You have the insignificance of this one human being against the whole vastness of the ocean. And so it's this really idea of this person's strength, their will to live, their desire to what? order nature. What? So one second, I'm going to go through and find out who is holding this money from. What are you saying? Why? There we go. Hey, like Caleb said, um, the discord and tension and then resolution music, good, good example. Right, and that's what makes makes it a beautiful story and that's what brings um, really the, the beauty and the context and the depth to the story of life, both in real life and also in fiction. So how does this relate to Nat's, str Nat's struggle to learn about navigation? And as he's now on these ships, and he's really beginning to practice what he's been learning for years. Did Nat have a desire to write? So like Michael said, he really wanted to change navigation. He really wanted to understand how the world worked and use that to save lives. Very good. Okay. 
Okay, so for those who, uh, because we didn't have the lesson posted out online, um, I'm going to include uh, throughout the lesson today, we're gonna, I'm going to be kind of reading some summaries of the chapters that were covered just for those who didn't have a chance to read the lesson and be able to see the assignment. So chapter 11, Nat's indentured servitude comes to an end, right? And now we're going to see all the opportunities that follow as he really begins to go and take all that knowledge and that um, book learning that he learned and apply it to the real world. So Nat was first invited to survey the streets of Salem, and then he later accepted an offer to be a ship's clerk and a second mate. So the Derby travels to the Isle of Bourbon off the coast of Africa. His second voyage takes him to Portugal and onto the Manila Harbor. And then while on board, Nat teaches the crew about navigation, and in the process, he tames the mind and heart of a troubled crew member, Lem Harvey, right? And we're going to be talking more about that today. We're going to be comparing and contrasting Nat Bowditch versus Lem Harvey and their teaching techniques. And, and so this is another literary element that's throughout Carry On, Bo Mr. Bowditch. There's a, there's a term that's used often in when you're writing, and that's show, don't tell. And what that means is when you're trying to communicate something, and this is a very important principle in speaking, in teaching, in writing, in music, in film. If you're trying to communicate a message, it's instead of talking about the message or saying the message, you should try to illustrate the message. And so you see this in Carry On Mr. Bowditch when she wants to teach you about Nat's character and show how what it is about him, his personality, that enables him to succeed in life. She could go on for two pages, three, four pages, talking about it. Nat is this, Nat is that. But instead what she does is she has dialogue and conversation between Nat Bowditch and uh, the man who was the loafer, right? Who remembers who, who I'm talking about there? The man who talks to him about where he gets the phrase, sailing by ash breeze. Ben, exactly, good. So she, what the author does is she compares and contrasts Ben Meeker and Nat Bowditch. And by the end of one conversation, she hasn't told you what she wants you to understand about Nat Bowditch, but you already have picked it up better than if she had told you. So she's going to do that. So that comparing and contrasting is a very important uh, principle when you're reading literature, when you're studying literature, when you're writing literature. And she does this again with Lem Harvey and Nat Bowditch. So here we have the historical background. So at this time in history, England and France are at war. So if you remember, with the Revolutionary War, you had the United States of America. They were fighting England, right? And towards the end, they did some alliances with France to be able to get support. So America wins freedom from England, and then England and France go to war. And ever since America had won that war, they had rights that they're still continuing to be fought. So you have the War of 1812, you have these other skirmishes going on so that ships can just go and navigate the seas for trade and commerce. So America is trying to stay neutral in their war, but both England and France are attacking the American ships and capturing cargo and men. So ships that are for are not warships they're still outfitted with weapons and guns and you have the different scene in there where they are saying hey you need to learn all the colors of the different flags of the different nations you need to assume that a ship is an enemy until it's been proven a friend and um so you have this added dynamic of not only is nat bowditch trying to learn navigation and he's beginning to use it on the ship, but he also has this experience he's learning with all the weaponry. Right, Jacob is exactly right. So that you have the two countries, you had England and France, and they are both angry at America. And America is trying to play the balancing game between siding with England and um, 
supporting England and not making France angry, but then also siding with France and not making England angry and wanting to stay neutral and wanting to not support either. And so it was definitely a tricky time. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to skip ahead the review from last week, but just really briefly, if you remember, right, Nat taught himself how to read. He taught himself how to speak Latin and French by using the scriptures from the Bible. Really quick, does anyone remember which scripture he used to first teach himself Latin? In the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God had the Word. Or something. Very good. Very good, Michael. Very good. John 1.1. 1, 1. Exactly. So um, that goes, and he's not a learner who just, is apathetic, right? He's someone where if he sees he needs to learn something, he embraces it, and he's willing to make the sacrifices necessary to learn it. Okay, so we're going to do a little activity. We have time here. Yep. So what we're going to do is for everyone that has the book, and if you don't have the book right with you, go grab it really quick. Um, go get your Carry On Mr. Bowditch book. And we're going to turn to pages 107, and we're going to do a little activity. I don't know if we'll get to do it all three pages, but we're going to do a little read-aloud activity. So I need a reader for Nat, a reader for Johnny, a reader for Keeler, and a reader for Captain Prince. And yes, they are all men, but girls, you're more than welcome to be one of the readers. I'm sorry, Griffin, I just saw your um, question to me. Um, in the future, go ahead and raise your hand, and that is where I will see it a little sooner so that you can be a panelist. Okay. Hey. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can I be Captain Prince? Yes, yes you can. Okay, um, so where are we supposed to be? Okay, one moment. Let's see. So we have a Captain Prince. Okay, um, Anna, you can be Johnny. I'll be Nat. Yeah, Nathan, you can go ahead and be Nat. And then um, go ahead. And those who haven't done it yet, we'll, we'll try to do an activity like this more often. So, And then, um, Josh, do you want to be Keeler? Hey, um, I, I am not that far in this book. We didn't start on time. Uh huh. Is that still okay? Yeah. Yep. So we're just gonna start on page one o. Let's see. Let's actually start with I. I. I will be the narrator. So we're gonna start at the bottom of page one o six, and so. It, I'm going to start right at the bottom, and so the first reader is going to be Nat. So whoever's Nat, be ready. So it goes, Captain Prince stood watching him. This is Nat. When Nat had finished, he said, How about a minute, sir? Won't I give you your longitude? Oh, yes. Okay. Um... Let's see, Nathan, we're going to start actually at the bottom of 106. Sorry about that. I know the screen oh, says... Oh, okay, sorry. Nope, no problem. That's my fault. So right when he goes, hmm, you are quick at figures. Actually, that no, that's Captain Prince. Sorry. Huh? Captain Prince, do you want to go ahead and start? Um, I, is it the... I don't see where it is. Okay, yeah, it's right at the bottom of page 106. And 
And the, and the narrator goes, when Nat had finished, he said, and then Captain Prince starts, hmm, you are quick at figures, Mr. Bowditch. Okay. So do I do it? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Hmm, you are quick at figures, Mr. Bowditch. Well, we got our latitude, all right. Latitude, that something else again. I wish parameters weren't so infernally expensive. Nat said. How about, how about in lunar, sir? Won't that give you your longitude? Prince shrugged. Once in a blue moon, you can get one, but by the time you've, you've worked out all your computer computations, it's about two days later. You may find out here, out where you were, but you'll never know where you are. I don't think the mat mathematics would take quite that long, sir. I like to try talking, taking a lunar first chance we have. Prince shrugged again. Go ahead. Be handy to our to know our longitude. If we can be sure. He didn't sound as though he thought much of the idea. Nat checked his nautical almanac closely, hunting for the first night the moon promised to be in a good position for a lunar. That night he went on deck before the time for his watch with his sextant. Little Johnny, the cabin boy, joined him. Mr. Bowditch, sir, would you tell me what you're doing? Of course, Johnny. I'm trying to find out a little more about where we are. We know our latitude, how far north of the equator we are. The trick is to find our longitude, how far east or west we are. East or west of where? Johnny asked, and then hastily. Sir? That's a good question, Johnny. First, we have to pick a north-south line to be east or west of. And since we used to belong to England, we use the same line that the English use, the north-south line through London. We call it the meridian of London. But how can we ever figure out how far west of London we are when we're here and London is away off somewhere else? We have to figure that by time. Nat told him. Johnny stared. Time, Mr. Bowditch, sir? Is that a joke? No, Johnny. Even 24, every 24 hours, the Earth turns around once. So the sun seems to be rising somewhere every hour, and, and even every minute. Where it's sunrise in London, we know it's sun, sunset halfway around the world. And a fourth of the way around the world is midnight. If we had one of those fine ship clocks called chronometers, we could and use it to tell how far from London we are. We keep it set to London's time. In the morning when we check our sunrise, we look at the clock and set and see what time it was in London. And we could figure how far from London we were because we know how many miles the Earth turns every hour. We don't have one of those uh, uh, special clocks, do we? No, Johnny. So I'm going to check our position by the moon. You see, we know by the nautical almanac exactly where the moon will be every hour, every minute, every second. And we know where a great many of the brightest stars will be. So if we can catch the moon, as it crosses in front of a certain star, we call it occulting the star. We can figure how far away from London we are when we see it happen. That sounds easier. Johnny declared. Nat grinned. 
Most people don't think so. There's quite a little figuring to do, but the big problem is to catch the moon crossing the front of a star from the from that is bright enough for us to still see the star when it's that close into the moon. There ought to be some better way to work a lunar, but we don't have it yet. Johnny stared at Nat, Nat Sexton and sighed. I wish I, I wish sometime I could look through a sextant. You can. The moon going, the moon going to be bright enough enough tonight for us to catch the horizon. I'll teach you a check port Polaris the North Star. The next night, when Nat came topside before his watch, Keeler approached him. Mr. Bowditch, sir, is it true that you let Johnny look through your sextant, or is the little lover lying to us? He did try his hand with the sextant. Would you like, would you like to? Me? You mean me? Why not? But, but, nothing, sir. That night, Keeler had his turn at hearing about the moon and trying to check the angle of Polaris. And then one evening during the dog watch before the stars were visible, Nat leveled his sextant to catch the horizon. Johnny was at his elbow. Mr. Bowditch, sir, what are you doing now? I'm sad to miss star. Sorry. Johnny I'm sad turned... to miss star. Johnny turned a puzzled glance to Nat. But there aren't any stars. Yes, there are, Johnny. There are always stars. We just can't see them all until it's dark, enough for them to show. When you want to get an angle of the on a star, and we don't have bright moonlight. The problem is to get the horizon when it it is light enough to see it, and to get the star when it's dark enough to see it. So I'm st starting to check the star while I can still see the horizon, and I'm watching here. I know the star will be will be when I can see it. Very good. Thank you, all of our excellent readers. Thank you. So why did Nat want to share his knowledge with Johnny? It doesn't say it specifically, right? in the book, but what do we kind of know about Nat that kind of would tell us why he's so eager to teach Johnny and share his information? He loved learning himself. Good. Nat probably knows what it's like to want to understand how the world works and not be able to just have someone be able to sit there and teach him call, um, very patiently and have the time to do that. Wouldn't you agree? Right. Like Haley said, he wants to embed his love of learning in others. He wants to help them understand that this isn't mysterious and it's not chance, that it's mathematical, it's logical, and this is how you can figure it out. So the next part of this, uh, of this of the book, so all these men gather around Nat during the dog watch, and many new men show up to learn, and Nat has, has to do things differently in order for the men to learn properly. Now what we're going to do is we're going to jump ahead. Actually, well, let's see. So 
so for those who read, okay, do you guys want to do another reading activity? Do you want to do another one? Okay, let's do it. So I need someone else, so who, someone who didn't get to be a character before. Okay, Michael, sounds like you're really eager to be Nat. So you can be Nat. And... Okay, so Jacob, it, do you want to be Captain Prince? And can I be Herbie? Yeah. Can I be Herbie? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. And I'm sorry to everybody. I know this is really fun, and we're going to get a chance to let everybody get a turn. Hopefully, throughout the throughout the year, we'll do this a lot. So. Okay, so we're going to start on page 110, and we're going to start at the top of page 110. So I'll start out as the narration. So it says, the men gathered round to listen. From that night on, the dog watch was Nat's busy time. Even Herbie, the huge Negro cook, wanted to hear Mr. Bowditch talk about the stars. Go ahead and you can skip the little Herbie said or Nat told him down through the chapter. So go ahead, Herbie. Okay. It kind of makes you think about the stars. Kind of makes you forget about soaking the salt beef till it's fifteen to eat, and about smelling the blige water. He shook his head and grinned. Just think of me learning things. Me. Of course you can. Of course you can learn. Every one of you can learn. But teaching them wasn't so easy. Time and again, Nat explained something in the simplest words he could think of, only to see a blank look on the man's face. Time and again, he wanted to shout, Um, I think you're supposed to do it as the narration because it's. Yep, but I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Nat do it since you guys hear enough of my voice. <laughs> okay, your brain—it's too fast. You stumble on other people's dumbness like a chair in the dark. Oh, let's see. I think we're up for time and again. He wanted to shout. What did Nat want to shout? Oh, sorry. Nope. Can't you understand? Any can't you see? Can't you understand anything? Yes. But he always remembered Elizabeth Boardman and the parallel rulers. He always remembered how she said, your brain, it's just too fast. So you stumble on other people's dumbness like a chair in the dark, and you want to kick something. And so he would bite back his impatience. Slowly, carefully, he'd explain again and again. And at last, he'd see the man's eyes brighten. He'd hear the happy, oh, yes, simple, isn't it? And Nat would grin. Yes, simple. When he got back to his cabin, he would write down the explanation that had finally made sense to a man. Just so I won't forget it, if I ever have to explain that again, he told himself. After three weeks, he had quite a stack of notes. He was making a new notebook, he realized. A very different sort of notebook. All his other notebooks just said enough to explain things to him, but this notebook said everything he had to explain things to other men, to the men who sailed before the mast. Weeks passed. Nat saw much more of the forecastle and the cabin boy than he did of the captain, the first mate, and their passenger. Captain Prince, Mr. Collins, and Monsieur Bonafoy dined together. The second mate dined alone after they had eaten. Nat didn't mind. At first, he read at the table. But after, he started teaching the men. He spent all of his time at mess, answering Johnny's questions. It helped to explain things to Johnny. After he'd made Johnny understand, Nat didn't have to go over things so many times to make the men from the forecastle understand. One day, Captain Prince called Nat to his cabin. The captain's grimness had not relaxed.
Tell me, Mr. Bowditch, just what are you trying to do with the men during the dog watch? Teach them what they want to know, sir. Captain Prince cocked an eyebrow. eyebrow. And can learn? They finally get it, sir. If I just find the right way to explain it. But, Mr. Bowditch, why are you doing it? Nat was silent for a moment. Maybe, sir, it's because I wanted to pay a debt I owe to the men who helped me. Men like Sam Smith and Dr. Bentley and Dr. Prince and Nathan Reed. Maybe that's why. Or maybe it's just because of the men. We have good men before the mast. Captain Prince, every man of them could be a first mate if he knew navigation. Captain Prince muttered something under his breath. An old business, but I've never see, had less trouble with the crew. Carry on, Mr. Bowditch. Aye, aye, sir. Someone tapped on the door, and Monsieur Bonifoy entered smiling. Let's see, does somebody want to grab Monsieur? We don't have a voice for him. Maria, do you want to be the Munchor right here? Maria Griffiths? Okay. Go. Maybe pick the person who was doing Herbie since they aren't going to be able to talk anymore. Yeah, I would, but uh, Maria wanted to be a character. So, Maria, if your mic's working, do you want to do that? Oh, here, Maria, I'm unmuting you. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, uh, which page is it? Sorry. No, nope, we're on page 112, and it's the, it's the second paragraph, and it goes, someone tapped on the door. All right. Okay. I have a confession to make, Captain Prince. I was eavesdropping through the skylights, not by intention. I just happened to be there. Could not help you... Monsieur Bauditch, he has the magnificent spirit. It is worthy of French Revolution. Liberty, equality, fraternity. What do you mean, the French Revolution? We started all this business of rebelling against kings. We did. We started it in 1775. It took you French until 1789 to get around to it. And then, for the first time since the Henry had sailed, Nat saw a twinkle in Prince's eye. Monsieur Bonifoy apologized. He was so embarrassed and he talked so fast that he had started talking in French. Without thinking, Nat answered him in French. Bonifoy beamed. Monsieur, you speak French? Why didn't you tell me? Uh, I, I guess I just didn't think of it. Captain you Prince roared again. And here I've been expecting all along I'd have to have an interpreter in the boardroom. Have you have any more tricks up your sleeve, Mr. Bowditch? No, sir. I, I don't think so, sir. No more languages. Just, ju just Latin, sir. I learned to read New Newton's Principia. Okay, we're going to stop there. Thank you again to all of our readers and Maria. Way to go. <laughs> well, my mom's French, so. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'm glad that you happened to get to be the French person. That was coincidence. There you go. <laughs> so I want to ask a question. I want to, Captain Prince makes an interesting comment. He says, I've never had less trouble with a, with a crew. Why do you think that was? Maybe because they they were behaving themselves because Nat was like teaching them and mm -hmm. um, Nat was feeling important because when you're being taught and when someone's taking time out, time that they could be using for better things, much more useful things to them, mm -hmm. and they really make you feel important and take time to make you feel important. Mm 
-hmm. it it really kind of hits you like a tidal wave. Uh, also, when you're learning great things, you're less likely to get into trouble. The, the famous quote is, "The idle mind, the an idle mind is the devil's workshop." Right? That's good. Good. Really good insights. I think it's a combination of all of these. Right? This this element where he was really te treating them as as equal human beings. He was treating them as men with intelligence and men with potential. And and then they were also had something to draw their minds up to, right? Ignorance and, um, and idleness only breeds, um, only breeds more ignorance and it only breeds more um, trouble, right? And so that was the situation we're getting into with many of these men on the crew when they didn't have something to occupy their mind with or something intelligent to be thinking about, they had, um, they were thinking about more intelligent things. They were starting to develop their mind. And that was really important, right? And that's a, that's a character attribute of God. Of course, God is the most intelligent, the most logical, the most brilliant mathematician and scientist. So when we work our minds and we really develop them and grow in self-discipline and able to push them to do, learn hard things, learn more difficult things, and don't let them just go to mush. That's the char a a character attribute of God that we're developing there. Exactly, Kayla. And yeah, go ahead, sorry. Um, when, when you notice someone's incredible, that when you really can appreciate someone like Nat for how smart he is or God for how kind and smart he is. I mean, and then you realize that they're taking time or that, that they really care about you. It just, yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Clean out that back gutter, Darren. Okay. Clean out that back gutter. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about, we're going to talk a little bit more about Nate, Nat's patience, right, and his long suffering. And that's really what he he exemplifies in in wait, all uh, of the studies. Wait, uh, Sorry, go, ahead. Ask, go ahead, Justin. Can I ask a little question? Mm -hmm. uh, why, were, why was the second mate that they had like the navigational people and stuff like that? Good question. Why the second mate? Does anyone know the answer to that? I might have an answer. Okay, go ahead. He was born. He was just going to be the ship's clerk, but then he got promoted to second mate aboard ship so that he would be help running watches and kind of being a minor officer in a way, because okay. the captain didn't want him just sitting around doing nothing between harbors. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Actually, if I recall, um, he didn't originally want, uh, he didn't originally go on the ship to be with Captain Prince. I may be mixing it up, but he didn't go on the ship to go with uh, Captain Prince, and Captain Prince said, well, I'm not having any idlers, so you're doing this job and this job, too, okay? Yeah, because Mr. Derby was going to take him, but then he stormed off in a fit, so Captain Prince took him anyway, but he had him do extra work. Okay, good. Great. Okay, that, that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's talk about Nat has a character attribute. So we've talked a little bit about some of Nat's character attributes. Let's talk about his ability to show patience and long suffering. What what is long suffering? What does that mean when we use that word or phrase?
it's um, showing patience for others, even though they that that they might be troublemakers or if um, other people have done something wrong to you, but you're still showing patience for them. Good. Good. Okay, like Haley said, it means to be persistent, persevere with patience. Now, the two words together, long and suffering, just don't really seem to have the best connotations, right? I mean, how many of us think, oh, yeah, suffering, that is what I want to go through today. That is my goal today, right? Hey, but, yeah, go ahead. You are going in and out, like, kind of like a robot. There is some way you can fix it because I'm not hearing you well. Okay, are you connected? Are you on a wireless internet connection or are you plugged in through an internet uh, cord or cable? I'm wireless internet. Okay, if there, I think that may be where the problem may be coming in. If it's possible by next class to... Okay, let's see. Looks like some others are having trouble. At all. I have trouble too. Okay. Let's see. I'm here. hearing the other ones though. There were some major problems and it's kind of coming in and down. Okay. Let's see. Okay, is it still cutting out here? Here I'm gonna do a test. Well, it goes off and on. Mm -hmm. Well, you're good right now. Okay. Let's see. I just put. I, I just paused the sharing the screen so that maybe if it's not trying to keep up with the PowerPoint slides, that would possibly be better. <clears throat> oh. Okay. Wouldn't that ruin it though? Um, I I'll put play when I switch to a new slide. So okay. Pause it again. So if we're better. talking about okay. something and it's out of sync with the slide, then send me a little message and that's probably why. Okay. So how did Nat show that being patient with others, especially when you're in a teaching situation, makes a difference? Um, it, when you're kicking a chair because you stumble over it, it either breaks the chair or really um, starts to break it. But when you're being kind to the chair and making sure that it isn't abused and that it's um, that it doesn't get squeaky and that there isn't too much weight on it and repairing it, then it doesn't break and it improves. And people are similar. Good. Um, I teach, I help teach gymnastics to kids that are like five and six and stuff and they have a hard time understanding so you, it's hard for me because I've done more advanced gymnastics and I have to slow down and make them understand and get into more fine details and sometimes it's frustrating because you're just like why don't you understand and I totally understand where Nat is coming from. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that Megan. Being the oldest of six children definitely comes with its um, experiences like this when you're trying, especially with my sister that's um, two and a half years younger than me, because I can, I'm, my brain works really easily in math and things, and hers doesn't, so when I'm trying to help her with math, I'll be like, why don't you understand this? I'm explaining it perfectly. This is exactly how I understand it. And then my mom will be like, well, you got to think that she thinks differently. So being patient just kind of makes it so that they feel confident. Because when you're impatient, I know a lot of the time I'm like, why don't you understand this? This is so easy. And they feel that makes them feel dumb. And so then they think they're never going to get it and they just shut off. Whereas when you're patient, it can help them feel open to it and make them feel like, okay, I can do this. This isn't that hard. And it makes it so that not only do you have a better relationship with them, but 
they're open to learning. Thanks, Kaylee. Thank you. So what is the common thread we see with um, when people tend to have more patience, more charity? Where does that come from? I'm going to point to a scripture. I think that it kind of reveals this. Doctrine and Covenant section 121. It's this scripture at the bottom of the screen. Um, Looking at that verse, so the verse says, Let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith, and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. And then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God. So where does charity and the ability to really, because if you think about it, Sam and Lem Harvey, comparing and contrasting, they both had a different level of self-respect or confidence. Would you agree? How did um, Lem Harvey and Nat have different levels of self-confidence? Well, Nat had, like, patience for the people he was working with while um, Lem was, like, shouting at people and bullying them and, like, being, oh, you're so stupid. Why don't you do this? But Nat was, like, patient. He tried to teach them the best way possible so that they didn't feel bad about themselves. Mm -hmm. And what we see later on in the chapter is we see, we, we find out why was Lem Harvey, why did he have that attitude, right? Lem Harvey was insecure inside right he he struggled with knowing his own failings he struggled with uh, weaknesses he had and he was insecure right so where does insecure where does confidence come from right you'd have insecurity on one hand and confidence would be the other um other end of the extreme so where does where does confidence no. come from as we learn from this verse in doctrine and covenants just do your homework, please. Um, I think confidence comes from being kind to others and then um, letting virtue garnish thy thoughts. So thinking wholesome, uplifting thoughts that helps you have confidence. Good. Good. Okay, Haley said God, right? Now is this, how is this different from what you might be taught in the world? Um, a lot of people think in the world that, that self-respect and confidence comes from having things having money, having friends, being popular in school, being an officer or a student body officer, something like that, someone who's in charge of something. And they don't realize that even though maybe you don't have those things that some people may have, if you're confident in the Lord and confident in God and confident that you are a daughter or a son of God, then you have... I would say even more self-respect and confidence than those people who maybe seem like they're the most confident people and the most popular people in the world. Good. I'm going to share a quick story and then we'll close with this. Um, my my brother plays basketball, and one while he was in high school, um, he and his teammates were getting ready for a big. Um, they were getting ready to go into this big competition, and so they're getting all prepared, and they notice that one of the top, the most popular guys on the team, the one of the most popular leaders, he was just sitting over on the side by himself. And, you know, they were going up, what's wrong? You know, hey, you want to come over and play? And he was just kind of just shrugged them off and was just sitting by himself. And, and my brother was thinking, hmm, that's really, that's strange, that's odd. Um, I wonder what's going on. And later it came out that actually he, this, this young man on the team, he had really been suffering from some deep insecurities and had actually been contemplating and even attempted suicide. 
And when my brother first heard that, it just didn't make any sense because he said, how, how in the world? This is the most popular guy almost in the entire school. He has everything you could possibly want. Everybody loves him. Everyone wants to be his friend. Everyone wants to be with him. Um, he's definitely the cool guy. Um, he has money. He has a car. He has the best girlfriends. He has everything he could possibly want. Why, why on earth would he be, of all the people in the school, contemplating suicide? And it really hit my brother in that happiness does not come from the things that we sometimes fall into thinking will make us happy. The food, the activities, the parties, the games, the um, recreation, the amusements, the movies. Those are not the things that make us happy. The only thing that will bring confidence and happiness in this life is, number one, as we learn in this verse, having your bowels full of charity, have, being filled with charity. And charity is more than just loving people. Charity is being willing to sacrifice what you want to do to serve others. Um, being like Joseph Smith or Mother Teresa, willing to go into the worst of places to make someone else's life better, willing to give everything you want to do to make someone else's life better. And then two, having virtue garnishing your thoughts unceasingly. That's more than just doing the right thing. That's thinking about the right thing. That's loving the right thing. That's investing your entire life in doing what God wants you to do. And to whatever degree you do that is the degree you'll have confidence. And really, I think that's what you see with Nat Bowditch's life. He has character traits that are character traits that God's commanded us to exemplify in the scriptures. And if we don't have and if we are not living those principles, if we are not living that lifestyle, we won't have that confidence. And we can try to turn to any other methods and tricks and games and activities and challenges and competitions, anything else that we might think might boost our esteem. But at the end of the day, nothing will come close to living a clean life. And so I'm just going to close with that story. Um, could I get a volunteer for a closing prayer? I will. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Just a second. Okay. Dear Father, thank you for this day and Learn that will to learn more of the of our, of what we need and want to learn today, and please let us learn to have a good day and stay turn the rest of the day, and and please let us learn to have a rest of the school day and a safe in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Now, Michael has a quick uh, student share thing he wants to do really quick. So if you need to go, you can go. But uh, Michael, go ahead. And then I will be on for probably about five or ten more minutes afterwards if you have any questions about homework and Canvas and lesson and everything like that. Okay, go ahead, Michael. Um. Yeah, so.